What's up, everyone? This is your host, Marco. And this is your host, Clayton. And you're listening to the pre Podcast. Podcast. Oh, yeah. Boom. Let's get it started. Let's do it. So first things first, LSU beat Alabama in football this weekend, so that's really exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. The state of Louisiana has exploded in excitement. It is a crazy time to be down here. The United States of Louisiana featuring our president, Coach O. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's a great time to be down here. We're so happy that game went the way that we wanted. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we beat a 31 game win streak in Tuscaloosa. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty so crazy. We're the number one team in the nation. I think we're going to take it all the way this year. I honestly think we're the number one team in the universe, but that's absolutely, that's just me. absolutely. So let's get started here with our random topic of the day, and that is the keto diet. So first things first, we'd like to give a special shout out to one of our classmates. So our friend Dylan Roberts, he has started the keto diet and um, we just wanted to talk about what the keto diet is. Yeah, basically you cut your carb intake to less than 30 grams of carbs a day and that puts your body in a state of ketosis. And yeah, essentially you just lose a bunch of weight from that. So basically what you're saying is you just need to eat a bunch of butter and nothing else. That's all you eat. It's okay. just butter. Okay, but if you do <laughs> if you do decide to start doing the keto diet, make sure you you ask your doctor um, before you start doing anything crazy just to make sure you don't have any health conditions that could predispose you to having health problems if you start this diet. Were you a nurse or something I know, before it's you like, came to dental school? It's crazy. It's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? That's awesome. But seriously, do talk to your doctor before yeah, you start seriously, the keto don't, diet. Don't listen to us. So anyways, this is our Veterans Day special. So a very big thank you and shout out to all our veterans here in the United States. We're very thankful for your service and we're thankful for everything that you've done for us. So this special is for you. Absolutely. And I want to give an extremely special shout out to my mom and dad. They both served in the um, Army Reserves and I could not be thankful enough to be raised by such awesome parents. Absolutely. Thank them for their service Absolutely. as well. So today what we're basically going to talk about is today's podcast, which is first off addressing some of the student debt because it relates to the topics that we're going to be discussing, which is the health profession scholarship program. So what are we going to be doing with that? So I'm going to um, just relay a statistic to say why we are talking about this. So in 2019, the ADEA, um, they came up with a statistic and they found that the average graduating debt for mm -hmm. dental students in 2019 was $292,000. Oh man. $292,000. <sighs> yeah. Mama what, Mia right what there. What a bit <laughs> that's, of debt. Yeah, that's, I mean, can you imagine being in your mid to late 20s and being $300,000 in debt, because that, that's not accounting for undergraduate debt that students may have occurred. That is strictly dental school debt they have occurred over their four years. It's crazy. Marco, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up, the Tooth Fairy never brought me $292,000. You know, I really wish the Tooth Fairy had brought me that much money. You know, I got quarters sometimes. I got dollars. I think one time I got a $5 bill. Yeah. I was over the moon. Oh, yeah. I was so thankful for that tooth fairy. I think I lost a molar one time, and I guess since it was a bigger tooth, the tooth fairy was like, oh, this is a big tooth. I can really give him some money for this. And I got like, you know, five bucks or something like that. But That's nuts. Yeah, but $292,000. So we wanted to talk about this program um, in the HPSP that could pay for your student debt. You wouldn't even have student debt, and you could also have some money in your bank account. So what is the HPSP? So it is the Health Profession Scholarship Program, and it is offered by the United States Army, the United States Air Force, and the United States Navy. And although the requirements for the three are a little bit different, just depending on the branch, overall the program is the same. And basically they pay for your school, so you get your tuition and whatnot covered. And we'll go into the benefits here in a little bit. I don't wanna to get too ahead of myself. Right. So they cover all your costs of school, and then you also receive a stipend while you're in the program, that way you have money to live off of. Awesome. So I think we should just go ahead and dive into some of the frequently asked questions I know that you have received because you are in the National Guard. And, Absolutely. And so I think we should go ahead and dive into some of the most frequently asked questions that we've been asked and I'm sure you have been asked. For sure, as for well. sure. 
So how do you even go about getting started? How do you learn about the HBSB program? Right, so first things first, you would want to go online and check your resources. So all of the military websites offer key details as to timeline, uh, GPA requirements that they may have, the commitments and the jobs available. So definitely do your homework. I mean, listen to this podcast as well, but you can't have enough information on Absolutely. this. I will say, be careful if you go on websites like Student Doctor Network, because people are gonna share their horror stories of applying and things like that. But I guarantee you, it's not all bad. It's a very good program and people, not to bash Student Doctor Network too right. much, yeah. but you need to be careful with the content that you read on there. But if it's a military website, definitely check them out because they're trying to get you hooked up. So that was that's what I would do first. And that, that is what I did first. Yeah. Although I will say I'm in the National Guard, so I did a different program versus HPSP. And we'll talk about that in a later podcast. But for now, for today's episode, we just wanna talk about HPSP. So once you've done your homework and you've decided that HPSP is something that you wanna do, I would talk to your family about the decision of potentially joining the military. And I would also reach out to a recruiter. So you can go to any local recruiting station, but be sure to tell them that you want to go to dental or medical school because HPSP isn't open to just dental students. It's open to people who are in the health profession and tell them you want to speak to the health profession scholarship program recruiter. Also, if you know anyone who's currently in the program, like a current dental student, you can reach out to them and even if their recruiter is not for your specific area that you're applying from, I guarantee you they can get you a connection. Now, I would personally stop by a recruiting office or try and give them a phone call. Sometimes emails take a while to respond. And as we're gonna talk about here in a little bit, HPSP is all about timing. So the sooner you can start it and the faster you can process all your information, the better. Awesome. Um, so this is just kind of off the, the transcript, but do I need to know anything about HPSP before I go to a recruiter? Absolutely not. The job of the recruiter is to recruit you. Okay. And they are gonna sit down and they're gonna explain everything to you. So part of the process is that this takes several months to complete. It's not that you can walk into a recruiting office and walk out as a commissioned officer that day. There's several steps in that process. So during that timeline, if you ever have any questions don't be afraid to talk to your recruiter. Don't be afraid to reach out to people who are currently in the military doing your profession or serving under your profession right. because they're going to be able to tell you exactly what it entails and answer any questions because the only dumb question that you may have is the question that you don't ask. Exactly. And you just alluded kind of to our next question and then being... How long does this take? Is this, you know, does this just take a couple of days to apply for this? Does it take right. weeks? Does it take months? How long does it take? Right. So this takes several months to complete just because it is a very strenuous process because it's a very generous program. Also, you're serving as a commissioned officer in the United States military, which is a huge honor. Some people work their entire careers to get to that point. So to be expedited so quickly into that position, they want to vet you and really make sure that they're making the right decision. So first we're gonna talk about if you are currently a health profession student, not currently enrolled in the program, but let's say that you're a senior in college or you have gone back and you're taking the prerequisites and you're going to apply that year. So let's say it's July, 2020, and you plan to matriculate and attend dental school July, 2021. You would wanna start the same time that you're applying school. So reach out to your recruiter because the worst thing a recruiter is gonna tell you is that you're too early in the timeline process. Because at that point, you can go ahead and get started on all your paperwork. You're gonna be ahead of everyone else that's applying. And then whenever it's time to apply, boom, you're all done. The worst thing yes. <laughs> that a recruiter can actually tell you is that it's too late in the application cycle and that you're going to have to wait a year. Because it, for a lot of the programs, it is rolling admissions. So the sooner you get it in, the better. So like I said, you're gonna to wanna to start the same time that you're applying. So if you're applying in the summer, which everyone should be doing, you're gonna to wanna to contact your HPSP recruiter and start then. So to continue on there, it is a very long process, uh, but don't underestimate how much paperwork there is. So that's part of the reason why it's so long. So you're need, going to need to fill out literally anything and everything about your life. So they're gonna to wanna to know about your family history, and what your parents are like, what your siblings are like, if you've ever even had a speeding ticket before, 
where you've lived for the past 10 years, where you've worked for the past 10 years, anything medically related, if you have any tattoos, and I, I know this seems a lot, but your recruiter will help you throughout this whole process. So don't think of it as daunting, but think of it as a vetting process to ensure that the military is receiving the best candidates possible to serve our country. So you're gonna have to fill out all that paperwork and they are extremely detailed in how they want it presented. So if there's one little space on one little page of a 50 page packet, they're going to kick your packet back and tell you to fix it. And that's just the way it is. And that's why it's so important to start so early. That way you have time to correct those errors because as perfectionists as we all are, I can guarantee you from experience that there are going to be some errors and that's okay. You just have to fix it. So going in as soon as possible. And then the other aspect of it is MEPS. So MEPS is the Military Entrance Processing Station. And that is where they do your physical evaluation to ensure that you are physically able to be in the military. So we'll talk about the physical fitness requirements later. That's different than MEPS. So MEPS is just making sure that you can pass a drug test, that you can pass a breathalyzer, that they're checking your vision, that they're doing blood tests to see if you have any transferable diseases, and that they're doing a full physical evaluation. So that would include the duck walk, which is where exactly what it sounds like. You have to bend down with your knees and waddle across the room. You have to wiggle your fingers and then a couple other examinations just to make sure that you don't have any joint problems because serving as an officer in the military can be physically demanding, plus the physical fitness requirements. So they just wanna make sure that you don't have any problems or that didn't, you, you didn't fib anywhere on your application. So. The other part is maintaining height and weight requirements. So you will need to be within certain parameters and that's based on your age and your sex. So male or female, and they'll take your height and then within your height, they'll have a minimum and maximum weight that you must be in between. And if you exceed the maximum weight, they're going to do a thing called the tape test. And I know this <laughs> from experience. You know, us, uh, us a little bit bigger folk say it's because of all the muscle. You're not big, you're fluffy. They're, oh, I wouldn't say fluffy. They're, they're just <laughs> I go to the gym love. every once There's in a while. To love. It's down the street. I see it sometimes yeah, when I true. drive by. Of course. Of course. <laughs> but anyway, so all the tape test does is it measures your neck and then it measures your abdomen and it sees if you're in a certain ratio. And if you're within that certain ratio, then it's okay that you haven't met weight, although you're gonna to wanna to meet weight eventually just because it's an indicator of how healthy you are. So you'll do the tape test and if you pass all your physics, not physics requirements, I'm thinking. <laughs> your physics requirements. Wow, having flashbacks here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, if you pass your physical requirements and you pass the tape test, then boom, you're gonna to go to MEPS and that factors into your board's packet. So your board's packet is a fancy way of saying your overall application. So you're going to have the application that I was talking about earlier with your family history, your speeding tickets or any other violations against the law. And they're going to run background checks. So it's, it's really important to be honest with your recruiter. And even if you think you might be medically disqualified because of childhood asthma or things like that, just be honest with your recruiter early on and they'll help you figure out whether or not you're medically qualified to be in the military. So you'll do that and you'll do maps and then you'll also have your boards. So that's not, that's a little bit separate from your boards packet. I know it's similar terminology, sure. but basically you have an interview and they're just going to ask you questions like, what do you do to maintain physical fitness? So whenever I had my interview, I know I talked about how I liked to go swimming a lot in undergrad and then I would run and do morning workouts and then try and maintain a healthy diet. They're also going to ask you, what makes you want to serve your country and why you want to join the military. And I will say this point right now, anything that you do in life, whether it's your board's interview or it's your dental school interview, or even just interacting with your patients one day, people are always going to ask you, why are you doing what you're doing? People don't always care about what you're doing. Right. They just want to know why you're doing it. Well, and I think we talked about that in our first podcast as well, because I got asked so many times, Clayton, you're a nurse, why are you switching from nursing to dentistry? And I'm still getting right. asked that question. And I have to know, you have to know that you want to join the military because it is a big commitment, even right. though it comes with all of these awesome benefits. Right, right, exactly. So you'll have your interview and I wouldn't stress about it too much because it's just a part of your overall packet. And they're just 
checking to make sure that your character is good and that you're a competent person. And honestly, if you pass through the dental school interview, you should be able to pass through your board's interview. Although that's not a guarantee, but just be yourself, be relaxed, but definitely do your research and try and figure out what to expect when it comes to that. Again, the more resources that you have, the better, because the more prepared you're gonna be. Don't sound scripted, be yourself. And we'll talk about that in a later podcast when we go yes. over interview tips, but definitely do your homework before you go into it. So you'll have all of those aspects of your application and that will all get factored in. And then the military at that point will make a decision on whether or not you're going to receive the health profession scholarship program. Now, if you apply for the program and you don't get it going into dental school, that's okay because you can apply for it again the next year and serve a three-year commitment. So I don't want to get too ahead of myself because that's the next question we have, but. So like you said, so you could do a three-year commitment, but so say you get it right as you're coming into dental school, you, right. you've got the HPSB program. Am I going to be serving in the military for 50 years or how long no. will I be serving? No, so you'll serve for every year that you receive the scholarship okay. program. So if you get it before you even come to dental school, so that would be the full four-year commitment, you owe them four years out of school. Now, what, was, what I was trying to say earlier is that if you don't get it that first go around or you don't apply that first go around and you apply during your fall semester of your first year, because again, you need to apply as early as possible. So don't wait until the spring semester of your first year. You need to do it at the very beginning. Then you could take a three-year commitment where they would pay for three years of school and then you would receive three years worth of the program. Now, once you're done with your four-year commitment or your three-year commitment, you're relieved of your contract. You can either choose to extend your contract within active duties or you could transfer over to the United States Reserves or the United States National Guard. So you have options and you don't have to end your military career. It's not like they're ever going to kick you out right. as long as yeah. you're a good and competent soldier. Right. But as far as your contractual obligation goes, it's done at the end of your four years. And as speaking of contracts, I love recruiters to death and they're great people. And especially in the health profession scholarship program, I truly believe they're gonna lead you in the right direction, right. but read your contracts. Don't sign anything until you read them. Even if anyone has made promises to you or blanketed statements that, well, the contract may say this, but it's actually that, I'm telling you right now, if it's not on paper, it didn't happen. Because recruiters change, because it may go from one recruiter to the next recruiter, and they don't know what the other recruiter told you but right. they can look at that piece of paper and say oh this is what it says so right and it's also the needs of the military at the right. time so so i think we've had a really good conversation so far about the hpsp program we're going to take a small little break and we're going to uh <laughs> answer this question that we got and we're going to try to start doing this every podcast we'll we'll answer a question asked by by one of y'all and y'all can just email us and what is that email it is the pre dental podcast at gmail.com so again, that is the pre-dental podcast, just like the name of our podcast, wow. at gmail.com. And if you are a pre-dental student, if you're currently in dental school, even if you're just an adult interested, yeah. maybe your kids are interested in dentistry, whoever it may be watching this podcast, be sure to just contact us, shoot us an email. You can even DM us on Instagram or message exactly. us on Facebook, but email is probably the best way to get a hold of us. And even if you're a nursing student listening right now or a pre-med student, we can, we'll accept <laughs> we'll accept y'all's emails too about this because it, I mean this it's very similar with the right, industry and, right. and medicine. Anyway, so we, we kind of got off track there, but we got a question, very real question, super and, real, super real, super super real, and it's coming from Kyle in Kylesburg. Kyle from Kylesburg. Yeah, very. It's uh, it's a real question. Um, so the question that Kyle posed to us, he says. So it looks like I'm going to be taking a gap year. What should I do? Well, you know, I said something, and you talked about it as well, like five or 10 minutes ago in this podcast. Yeah. And it said, why are you doing that? So that's the first question we need to ask Kyle from Kylesburg. Yes. Why are you taking this gap year? So if you're taking the gap year because you feel like you just need to find yourself. <sighs> I... I, I get it, kind of, but the thing is, if you just need to find yourself, 
Like you don't really know if you want to be a dentist yet or not. You should have already realized if you wanted to be a dentist by this point, if you're planning to apply to dental school. Right. So you should already have that figured out by now. Right. But there's another side of that. So what's the other side? So again, I was an economics major in undergrad. So a big thing we talked about throughout the four year study is opportunity cost. So there's two facets of this. The first one is that every single year, the cost of education is rising. Some of it may stay stagnant, but there's never really been any years, especially in higher education, such as dentistry, where the cost of education is decreasing. No. So every year that you take off, it is going to be more expensive for you to get that degree. And the second thing is your opportunity cost. So let's say that you want to work for a year and save up a little bit of money before you go to dental school. And while yes, I understand that, that's also what student loans are for or the health profession scholarship program. Right. Because let's say that you work for a year out of undergrad and you, you get a pretty good job and it's paying about $50,000 a year. So you make $50,000 and then you go to school for four years, which again is more expensive than if you had just done it a year before. You have to think about it like this. You're now graduating a year later. So that year later that you're finishing up your D4 year, you could have been working as a dentist easily making, let's say $110,000 a year. So compare $110,000 a year versus $50,000 the opportunity cost that you've lost because you decided to take off a year is $60,000. So you've kid yourself out of $60,000 just by procrastinating for a year. And so here's the other part too, I know this is like a three part thing, but say you applied and you didn't get in. Well, then you need to take that. That's going to be a gap. Right, you don't have a decision but, exactly. at that point. But don't ever be afraid to apply. So say you maybe have a lower GPA, you may have a lower DAT score, go ahead and apply. You still have the chance to get in. You have a 0% chance of getting in if you do not apply. Exactly. So go ahead and apply. But if you have a lower GPA, you apply and you don't get in, then go to a master's program. Maybe your DAT score is too low. That's understandable too, if you don't get in. Well then, retake the study for the DAT some more, retake it, but maybe get a job as a dental assistant where you can also be learning about dentistry um, while you're taking your gap year. You won't just be wasting your time sitting on the couch watching Netflix. I mean, even, I mean that sounds pretty nice, but <laughs> you, know, you need to be showing that you, you use that year to benefit yourself and the profession that you want to be in. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm sure that we'll be doing more episodes down the road, absolutely. whether that's interviewing people that took gap years and some of the different options that they did, or just discussing the options in more detail. Right. So stay tuned for that. But anyways, we're going to get back to discussing the Health Profession Scholarship Program. And here we go. What's the next question we got? So this is a big question, because right. this is a question that I'm sure that you've probably got asked quite a bit. Um, but it is, will I be fighting on the front line? So that was pretty much the only reason why my mom did not want me to join the military is that she thought they were going to give me an M16, a helmet <laughs> and a vest, and they were going to put me in a trench somewhere and that I was going to go to war and something was going to happen to me. And while we do have soldiers in the military who risk their lives each and every day for our safety, and we're eternally grateful for so, that. So, 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 so grateful. That is not the MOS of a dentist. So a dentist in the military does dentistry. Your MOS is called your military occupation code. So basically that is the job that you are contractually obligated to complete. So when you do your training, whether it's at Bullock or officer candidate school or however you decide to get to become an officer, you will have weapons qualifications and you will have training with different weapons. However, if the military is paying four years or three years, for you to become a dentist and is then paying you a salary to work as a dentist, they want you doing dentistry because they're making that investment for you. It's pretty expensive. I mean, that's a lot of money that they are investing into. And we're gonna get into that here in just a little bit about how much money they are investing in, in you and how much money you're going to get. Right. But another very important question is, is it dangerous and can you be deployed? Right, so there is a risk with everything in life. However, I would say that the MOS as a dentist is a lot 
less risky than some of the other professions in the military. So yes, you can be deployed. However, that could be anywhere in the world. So whenever we say deployment, people think that they're going to a war zone in the Middle East and they're gonna be on, under constant hellfire and things like that, but that's simply not the case. A deployment can be anywhere in the world. So for example, the military does a lot of humanitarian efforts throughout the world. So they may send a unit over to India for five months to do work on people in impoverished areas, or they may go to Madagascar, or you may just be stationed at a international base. So South Korea or Italy, they, it could really be anywhere in the world. So the odds of you ending up somewhere that is a war zone is extremely unlikely. And even then, again, you're practicing as a dentist, so you're probably not going to leave the base and you're going to be relatively safe. So while yes, there is risk in anything that you do, I mean, it is the United States military, you are pretty safe, but yes, you can be deployed. And in fact, that is one thing with the health profession scholarship program is that for the next three or four years after dental school, they determine where you live. Basically, you'll make a pref list of some of the bases that you want to be stationed at and they'll do their best to match you with where you want to go but it ultimately comes down to the needs of the military at the time so some people end up in the middle of missouri some people end up in hawaii some people end up in italy kylesburg do people end up in, <laughs> people uh, end up in kylesburg you know i'm not too sure if kylesburg has a base but the bases are nice. They have incredible facilities at most of them. And that's also determined on what branch of the military you go into. So an Air Force base is going to be different than an Army base, which sure. is going to be different than a Naval base or potentially a Naval carrier. Awesome. So um, I think we already covered the where will I live part right. of the question. Got a little ahead of myself yeah. there, but you know, they go hand in hand. Exactly. They do. They do. <laughs> um, so what are the benefits? That's, that's, that's a big thing when we're talking about right. serving your country. I mean, it, it's very important, but you also want to have some sort of benefit right. with this too. Yeah, so first and foremost, the Health Profession Scholarship Program is an incredible program that does pay for school and gives you a stipend to live off of. But that's not the only reason why people do it. For myself, I joined the National Guard because I wanted to serve my country. You know, my dad is an immigrant and this country has provided him with unbelievable opportunity to help my family become, or to get into a better place, right. I should say, versus where he came from. So some people simply wanna give back to our country, regardless of what your backstory is, or some people simply just love this country and wanna serve in some capacity. So that's why a lot of people do it. But yes, the benefits are good. So like we were saying, if you're in the Health Profession Scholarship Program, you don't see a bill from the dental school. So you'll never take out student loans for the cost of your education, the military handles that directly and just pays it directly. So you don't have to deal with any of that. We'll do a second part about the National Guard where that works a little bit differently, but for now just know that HPSP covers the cost of your education and that includes your tuition, your books, your supplies, and by the way, your supplies in dental school, <laughs> Oh, it hurt. It hurt when we, when we got that first bill this semester. I mean, it was, it was painful to look at really. Right, you know, those high-speed hand pieces are very nice, but wow, those instruments between renting them and purchasing them, it's, it's a lot, but the military covers all of that for you. And they additionally give you a stipend that's around $2,300 a month. Oof. Yeah, so it comes out to almost 30,000 a year. So you get paid, hold on, you get paid $30,000 $30, a year to do, to do what? Like to go to dental school. Oh, wow. So that was something I probably should have discussed a little bit earlier, but while you're in school, your military obligation and your military job is to go to school and become the best dentist that you could possibly be. So that, that probably should have been a question that we discussed when talking about deployment, but some people say, oh, I don't want my education to be interrupted. Right. What do I do? Well, you're not going to be deployed while you're in school. That wouldn't make sense for the military to invest in your education and spend all this money and then pull you out in the middle of a semester. Right. Because in dental school, it's not like you can just jump back in the next semester. You have to wait an entire year. So just know that you won't deploy. But to get back on track, yes, they do pay you to just go to school. And you do need to maintain your physical fitness during right. that time. And 
you know, get haircuts and shave your face. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so you also get a signing bonus and I think it's about $20,000. Once you're accepted into the HPSP program, you get the stipend, your school is paid for. And then another fun part is that you get military discounts at a lot of places, whether that's Lululemon, I know they offer 25% off. Isn't that like a legging? Do you get a lot of leggings? From you know, I, I personally don't really wear the leggings. Okay. Um, there's some girls in our class that do, awesome. you know, good thing for them, whatever. Yeah. I don't really care what they wear. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, so you'll get different benefits at different stores or like free baggage um, plus TSA pre-check whenever you fly. So there's a lot of military benefits that go into that as well. And they're very generous. And then also not from a financial standpoint, but simply from um, like a skills standpoint is getting that experience after dental school. So some schools prepare their students better than others clinically. Right. And I would say we're very lucky to attend LSU because I believe we're one of the best, if not the best clinical program in the country, you know, I shameless agree. plug there. But some schools may not provide their students with enough opportunity, whether it's a lack of patience or a lack of resources to have instructors there all the time monitoring student doctors. But anyways, once you're out of school, you'll be working for the United States military doing dentistry every day. So that gives you experience just to focus on your dentistry because you're not having to do practice management. You're not having to negotiate contracts with the DSO or some new business partners. You're not, have to, not having to worry about where you're living because you'll be living on a base or other factors like that. It really allows you to get very quick at the profession. And some people go into it because they get that experience. So it's almost like an extended internship. Right. Because the military is going to train you to be very efficient and very good at what you do. So another question that, that I've been asked, people come up to me and they say, Clayton, I don't want to be a general dentist. Do right. I have to become a general dentist to be in the HBSP program? So here's the thing is that when you start dental school, everyone is going to become a general dentist. So when you walk across that stage at graduation, you are a general dentist. You are a competent doctor as long as you've met the requirements of the school, as long as you've passed your board exams. Now, if you want to specialize, then that's up to you. And if you're taking HPSP, then yes, the military does have specialty programs that are open just for people. But like any specialty program, it depends on the needs and your ability to get accepted into the program. So while it is a little bit different for HPSP because there are specialty programs that are or residency programs, right. some people call it that as well, just to get right. with the lingo. There are some that are reserved specifically for service members that you can receive. But if you want to be a periodontist, for example, and your branch of the military doesn't need any periodontist right now, then yes, they may ask you to just hang back and be a general dentist for the time being until potentially one of those programs opens up. So the HPSP is designed just for you to be a general dentist, but there are several options for you to specialize if that's something that you're looking into and if that's something that you're competitive towards as an applicant. Awesome, well, it's encouraging that you have options and you're not, you, you don't just have to be this one thing if you want to be right. something else. Right. So it's encouraging. So it's not guaranteed, but sure. it is an option more times than not. Right. So our last question is going to be, what is my salary going to look like in the military? Am I going to make as much being in the military as I would in private practice? Or how does that all work? So there's two sides to that coin. So some people don't do HPSP and they take out the student loans. And then when they graduate, they work in either DSO or private practice. Sure. And now they're paying off their loans. They're either working for someone or they're paying off the practice that they just bought. And some believe that because of the private practice salary, which is more than the military salary, that they can pay off their debt and make money faster than people in the military. Now, how the military where it works is that you're receiving that stipend for four years and you're accruing zero debt while you're doing it. So you have, again, zero debt and you're getting paid almost $120,000 over the course of your four years to be a student. And most of that money goes towards your living expenses, whether that's a car or rent 
or groceries or whatever other expenses you may have. But once you get out of school, again, no debt, and then the military pays you a set salary year for year for your four-year commitment. So the salary is not as much as you would make in a private practice, and your salary doesn't go up or down based on the amount of soldiers that you take care of, or as you would say in private practice, the patients that you see. Right. So again, it's a set salary, and although it's less than what you would make in private practice if you weren't in the military, you're also living on base, so your housing is paid for, plus other benefits that the military offers. So I know TRICARE is a very, very, very affordable health insurance that's available to service members. You also get access to USAA and other insurances for auto insurance. I know I switched to an insurance company that was for service members. And I think it saved me like 200 bucks a month. It was pretty cool. It was, yeah, it was crazy. So the benefits are there. So I would say don't worry about the money as much either way, but it is nice not having any debt coming out of school and then having a set salary and just focusing on the dentistry versus trying to make as much money as possible to pay off this 290 yeah. to $293,000 right. in debt that you're having 6% interest on. Yeah, and, and we talked about that earlier, but we're, we're going to have another podcast um, soon just talking about finances and loans and things like that. But what they don't tell you really when you, you get out of undergraduate school, when you take those loans out, you start accruing interest immediately. Day one, baby. Day one, they start charging Woo! some interest. And it gets expensive. And that's why people graduate with $292,000 in student right. debt. Right. It's not that they took out $292,000 to no. pay for school. It's the fact that they had interest occurring for all four years. And your first year or your first semester oh. is the most expensive. So it's, it's a lopsided system it where... Is. You have to take out the most money at the very beginning, and then that amount that you take out is occurring or accruing the right. most interest for those four years. It's not that the interest doesn't start until you uh, graduate. Right. It would be nice if it did, but right. unfortunately it doesn't. Well, and that's how most undergraduate loans work, and you think that's how it's going to work for dental school, but it's not. But like I said, we, we will talk about that more in future podcasts. For sure. But for now, we would like to end our podcast with advice from a current dental student. So it is um, Mackenzie, and she is at A.T. Still University. And what does Mackenzie say? So I want to say hello to Mackenzie. She's a very good friend of mine, and I want to thank her for her advice. And she encourages all our pre-dental listeners to look up dental news every once in a while, because not only is it important to stay up on the topics of dentistry, such as new technologies and new information, but you're going to get asked that in a lot of interviews. And I, I felt though, pretty much in all of my interviews, oh, yeah. that they asked me, what's a huge problem in dentistry or what's a problem in general in dentistry that our generation is currently facing or what's a new technology that you're excited about? And these are things that you need to be aware of because this is the profession that you're going to enter. Exactly. And healthcare is ever evolving. So it's always changing. Nothing is ever the same because you, you could learn something this way and then in a few years it changes. So you kind of need to stay up to date with dentistry and just what's going on. Because like Marco said, this is your profession that you want to be in. And they're going to ask you not only why do you want to be in it, but what do you know about it? Exactly. I know that we've been in school for less than six months and people are always asking us even though because they consider us doctors for yeah, whatever yeah, reason i don't know why but they ask us a lot of questions about dentistry in general and a lot of those articles that we read help us keep up to date so becoming a pre-dental member of the american student dental association is one of the best ways to do that they send out articles two or three times a week they also have contour which they publish and just reading those i mean they're like 500 words or less, and it could be anything from what's it like to own a dog in dental school to CAD CAM technology that's being released or wellness and going to therapy while you're in school. It can be about literally anything, yeah. but staying up to date on those, it's going to not only interest you in the profession even more than you already are, but it's going to help you stay well informed. And that's just one step ahead of the game that you can be before you even get to school. Exactly. 
Well, I think we've answered um, most questions about the HPSP program. We've talked about the gap year. And it, like we said, if y'all have any questions whatsoever, it doesn't even have to be about HPSP, just email us. It's thepredentalpodcast at gmail.com. And be sure to subscribe on YouTube as well. Um, we have just got the news that we're going to be on iTunes. About an hour ago, about right? About an hour ago. So we're going to be on iTunes now, and you can find us on iTunes, Google Play. I mean, you can go on Instagram. Spotify. So, Spotify. Well. YouTube. I mean, come on. Too easy. You too can listen easy. listen to us on everything. Yeah, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and check us out and see what we're all about. We'll be coming out with new episodes very soon. And again, be sure to email us if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. But for now, this is your host, Marco. And this is your host, Clayton. And we want to thank you for listening to the Pre-Dental Podcast. Oh, yeah.